That's the mansion straight ahead. That's the mansion straight ahead. So this is the brief story of the Watson Curtsy Mansion. Harrison Watson sitting at his desk, which uh, we'll go and show you as we go through. Mrs. Watson was a incredible gardener. Um, this all used to be glass. The glass was replaced by the school district about 70 years ago, but this was just a packed greenhouse of um, plants and flowers. We now use it mainly for um, when we're, uh, we have events here. This is used for refreshments and whatnot. Normally we have the original chairs that sat around the dining room table, but we don't have enough of them. So for the event that we're doing for the wedding, um, we set it up with these uh, uh, more modern chairs. But you can, if you just look around, um, this is a gorgeous room. Stained glass windows, um, beautiful woodwork, carved um, uh, with a great degree of skill, um, intricate carvings all over the house. This is the Watson's original china from 1892, which we were able to uh, purchase from their estate about three years ago. Um, this is Limoges china, and it's just gorgeous. We're happy to have it back in the house. Um, these chairs here are original chairs to the dining room. Um, again, they dating back to the 1890s. Each room is styled differently, which is pretty fascinating. If we move into the old library, again, which is uh, getting set up for a wedding, um, you can see the, uh, the wood has changed, the style of carvings have, have changed. That's Mr. Watson's desk here, um, which uh, you saw in the other painting. He was sitting here in front of his desk um, in, that, uh, in that photograph. But this was originally used as a combination of things. It was used as an office, as a library, and also as a, a family place you can see overstuffed couches in the uh, early years, uh, lots of plants again. And if you look again uh, closely, you see uh, more intricate carvings. They all have meanings to them um, from, the, uh, from the 1890s, but a completely different style from the room that we were just in. And Mr. Watson was a built his house along what is known as Millionaire's Row. And Watson was a millionaire when being a millionaire really meant something. Uh, you can see over here we have a copy of one of his advertisements. Um, he uh, specialized in roofing products. And he had um, not only Erie, which was his headquarters, which is the uh, uh, right above the railroad tracks in 14th and French, you can see the, uh, the image there. But he also had factors in Chicago and New York, um, in Nashville, um, and St. Louis. So he, um, he was a nationwide uh, uh, industrialist. Um, we came into the house essentially through the back door. But when you enter the mansion, when the guests would have entered the mansion, they would have come through this door. And if you get an idea what this grand entryway it looked like it was built to impress. Um, we have the mosaics, we have the uh, marvelous stone fireplace, all the intricate carvings around it. Um, it. When you walked in here, people were supposed to take notice and be impressed by uh, this. Again, we have it cleared out a little bit because of our, our event this weekend, but um, it really, uh, you, can, you can see how, how beautiful this is. But after Mr. and Mrs. Watson died, um, and uh, the wife in 1923, their daughter Winifred, who had married Eli Griswold from Griswold Manufacturing, sold the mansion and sold it to Frederick Curtsy. The Curtsy family, um, uh, Frederick was a banker um, and had many other uh, activities, industrialists and whatnot. And um, uh, his family still is involved 
uh, in Erie's economy. But the Curtsies kept it for about 20 years until Mr. Curtsy passed away. And then they gave it to the Erie School District um, uh, for the purpose of having a public educational museum. And uh, the school district held onto it until the year 2000, and then um, the, uh, uh, the museum merged with the Erie County Historical Society. And um, in 2015, uh, this became the, uh, the headquarters for the Historical Society Museum, in which we have now renamed the Hagen History Center campus after our patron. So this is the formal parlor. We've had several weddings in here. It's so beautiful. Um, the, the wallpaper is actually a fabric. And um, this is a reproduction of what was here. But um, it's just absolutely beautiful. And again, um, it looks completely different from the other rooms in the house. You can see the beautiful carvings in the ceiling. And the, this was where they formally entertained. And just to show you yet just another kind of fun piece, this pocket door, as in all the pocket doors downstairs, on one side, of course, matches the room here. But if you come around, the other side matches the room on the other side of the door. From the mansion, and we'll show you more rooms, but we have something to offer for everybody those that like to see old homes, those that like to see um, exhibits, you know, modern exhibits as far as Frank Lloyd Wright, our military heritage, our canal. Uh, we have several exhibits upstairs, which I'll show you. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's a place for people to really learn about Erie, learn about uh, their heritage, um, uh, be able to imagine themselves in a mansion like this. One of the things that we're doing, and we'll show you upstairs, for the first time ever on public exhibit is we are going to have the uh, servants' quarters in the house open. So not only do you see how the millionaires lived, but you can see how the people that worked for them lived. This is Mr. Watson's private office. Later in life, he had some uh, issues um, with uh, an unnamed disability so that he had, he had trouble walking. So where contemporaries of his may have been out hunting or playing golf, um, his interest turned inward. And all these drawers used to be filled with butterflies and minerals that he would collect. And if you look up, this is the only built, uh, room in the building that has vaulted ceilings, which is his personal style. And again, everything you see here is in a, in a different architectural design style than the rest of the house. And one little note is if you look down, see how thin those floorboards are, mm -hmm. those hardwood floorboards? Um, that, was a, that was a style, it was expensive to do, but he had it done for his personal office. <laughs> All the modern conveniences. <laughs> That looks like the early 20th century, or actually it could be the late uh, 19th century. Right? Probably was late 19th century. Yeah. Well, you have a crank on the side to call the operator to tell you you want to make a call. And today we have iPhones. <laughs> so, right. Times have changed. Times have changed. <laughs> Here is an elevator. Now, oh, okay. we've, put, we've put a modern elevator inside the old shaft, but this was the first private home in Erie to have an elevator. And because Mr. Watson had some mobility issues, he, um, he used it to go up and down the stairs. This is the house's traditional kitchen. And what we have in here now, primarily, is our exhibit of uh, Griswold ironware. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Winifred Griswold, the daughter of the house, married Eli Griswold, and we have about 700 pieces of Griswold iron. Now when they had their housewarming for this building, um, 
1892 in the winter. Uh, this was the caterer's menu, which included um, fresh fruits and vegetables and flowers from all over the world. Uh, we estimate, based, based on the cost, that their housewarming party in today's dollars would have probably cost them $100,000. This stove originally belonged to the Watsons, although it was in their summer house up um, off of Wolf Road. But um, it's a uh, gas fire. You, um, you could bake your bread up on top. Of course, you had your your uh, gas fixtures there. You could use stove polish to polish it up. And for the ladies of the day, particularly the servants, um, this is how you did your ironing. And so you heat your iron up on the uh, on the stove until it gets nice and hot, and then you would uh, do your uh, do your work, cool off, put it back on, and that was a certainly um, uh, more tiresome than the way you can iron today. <laughs> this is an ice box before modern refrigeration. Um, uh, you would have an ice man come and drop off a block of ice, which would go in here, and the outside is all insulated. And, um, likely, the ice had been cut from the bay the previous winter and stored in ice houses, but um, you would um, keep your food on either side. Interestingly enough, my uncle was one of the last ice men in Erie. Uh, we'll go down the grand staircase on the way out. Little uh, mini exhibit of uh, dresses from the turn of the century. This would have been where the band would play to entertain the people in the uh, parlor and lobby. This is Winifred Watson's room. She was the daughter of the house. There she is at about eight, nine years old. Um, and this is, so this is where she... Now her bed was here, but we have chosen to put uh, a case in showing uh, toys of the era. There she is with her tutor. Um, this would have been in the mid-1890s, and she is sitting, as you can see, right there. <laughs> Quite a room she was in. Quite a room. Beautiful uh, uh, fireplace, rose window. But we're also showing the contrast here on these panels between her life of privilege and other kids growing up here in Erie. Here, again, um, you can see she and her tutor again sitting right on that spot. So we're going to use this for photo ops for kids so they can get their picture taken just as Winifred did 125 years ago. This table is interesting because we're using it to show some contrast, again, between um, her and others. Um, we have a diary written by a young German immigrant uh, girl, um, daily diary, it's uh, 100 plus pages long, and she wrote it on the back of her, um, her daily lunch bag. And it's in English, but um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great contrast from uh, those that lived here. This is an interesting photograph. Um, this is 1907, and it's uh, a number of, of kids um, at a birthday party, and um, these are all uh, either German immigrant or children of German immigrants living up in South Erie. You know, what's really poignant for me in this is I've identified almost all of them they're all related 
and this is my dad. Really? Yeah. Wow. But again, trying to show the contrast, and these kids are dressed up in their Sunday best to go to the mm. birthday party. <laughs> but, you know, they grew up, you know, working class, and, you know, it's, it's a way to, to contrast um, um, how multiple sides of the uh, community lived. During the Civil War, Erie had a, uh, had a real presence. All of our regiments from Erie um, fought in key battles um, we had the average number of men from communities across the country that volunteered or were drafted was under 50 percent. Erie had almost two-thirds of their men um, of military age um, go to war. Um, these three flagstaffs, which are on loan from the library, are flagstaffs of the three major Erie regiments, the 83rd Pennsylvania Strong Vincent's Unit, the 111th Pennsylvania, and the 145th Pennsylvania. What's particularly telling about this flight staff for the 145th Pennsylvania is that it was only in one battle because it was so badly damaged. It was hit by a Confederate artillery shell and broken, as you can see there. Also look at the eagle. His wings were shot off during the battle. At the Battle of Fredericksburg, where this happened, um, this was the color company um, of the 145th. Almost every man in that picture was killed or wounded. Uh, the 145th PA suffered the highest number of battle deaths of any unit in the Union Army at the Battle of Fredericksburg. The 83rd Pennsylvania, and this is, these are two of the 83rd's flags here. By the way, Color, color Sergeant uh, Alex Rogers was killed in, on May 5th of 1864, that's him in both of those pictures. But they suffered the second high, highest number of battle deaths of any unit in the war. So they, these were hard fighting units. And um, this is, this is a, a replica of a Pennsylvania battle flag that would have flown on one of those flag steps. So this is our Civil War room. Um, and it honors um, the, our service. If you turn around, you'll see Strong Vincent's sword, um, that his field sword that he carried with him. That's on loan to us from the State Museum. But we have, everything else in here has specifically to do with Erie men in Erie service. Um, The cane up there, 90% of the soldiers' time was sitting in camp. So they got very creative with things, some of them. Uh, this this uh, cane was carved in the spring of 1862, um, and it was dated June 1, 1862. Um, the soldier that carved it, um, actually uh, Charles Dow, was killed a month later at the Battle of Malvern Hill. Mm -hmm. The 83rd Pennsylvania was awarded these fancy French uniforms um, because of their uh, proficiency in drill um, at the beginning of the war. We have multiple pictures of soldiers in those uniforms and parts of those uniforms. However, um, they were not practical for field use, and so they turned them all in before they, uh, they went off to the actual fighting. We also um, raised uh, uh, Units are meant for a number of uh, United States colored troops or black units here in Erie. Um, this is Camp William Penn in Philadelphia with some of the guys from uh, the regiments that were raised here. Although we don't know if any Erie guys are in that picture, but uh, we, we honor their service as well. We had soldiers that you know, fought the Navy, uh, artillery units and whatnot. Uh, some of those pieces back there were captured uh, Confederate uh, pieces. Um, very interesting story here. This young man was Oliver Wilcox Norton. Norton was a young school teacher living out in Springfield, Pennsylvania, in West County. Uh, he would volunteer for the war. He'd become a bugler. And uh, he, along with General Daniel Butterfield, 
whose photograph you see over there. Um, one night after the defeat of the Union Army um, in front of Richmond in 1862, um, Butterfield wanted to have a different tattoo or lights out. And so he and Norton spent an evening composing what we know as taps. Norton was the first uh, man to sound taps. He also was the first one to write it down. Because although Butterfield had an ear for music, he couldn't write music. So uh, Norton was the, was the one that actually wrote taps out. And uh, again, he was born in, over in Sherman, New York, but was um, living here at the outbreak of the war. We have a number of uniforms. This man, um, uh, Captain Martin Gifford, you can see his photograph in the back. That's his uniform. He helped to carry Strong Vincent um, off of a little round top of Gettysburg when Vincent was mortally wounded. And we even have his wallet, which still had Civil War era money inside when we opened it. These are cavalry weapons used of the type um, uh, of the units that were raised in Erie. This is Captain Israel Thixton, 83rd Pennsylvania. His uniform, sword, his blanket. When we put this exhibit up, his family, who had loaned it to us, came in and they had no idea we had this photograph. His great great grandson looks like his twin. When the family came in, um, they were just astounded at looking at the uniform and looking at him. Um, his, uh, his great great grandson's wife and uh, his great great grandson's mother were in tears. You know, this is a very poignant moment to, um, to see something that they had sitting in the closet for all those years come alive to them. Styles of Victorian dresses um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's a work in progress, as you can see, but uh, this will be a, uh, a nice exhibit when we are, have it uh, completed. So this is something I'm particularly proud of. It's something that I've wanted to do in the five years that I've been here. Um, it's part of our uh, latest round of exhibit building. In contrast to Winifred's bedroom, uh, with all the style and luxury, we come this way. We are building out the servants' quarters. And uh, we have two bedrooms and a bathroom. That we, are, that we are renovating. Obviously, it's a work in progress, but we want to uh, have people be able to see how um, not only the, the, the folks in the front of the house, the millionaires, live, but how the folks um, back here um, who work for them lived. It'll be a little hard to tell, but the floors are going to be refinished. We have furniture. Um, and by the time people come here by July 17th, this will all look like um, you would step back again 125 years. Wow. Yeah, when I said two hours, <laughs> if, I, if I'm going to give up. Relatively thorough tour. Right. That's about really what it takes. Well, it was well worth it. I mean, this is just uh, not only this is a beautiful mansion, but the history, which is not only just Erie history, it's American history. And you have some some great artifacts going back War of 1812, Civil War. I mean, that's 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 really amazing. So, George, thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Well, it's been great. I appreciate meeting you both. Looking forward to uh, seeing what you put on your yes. uh, YouTube, YouTube channel. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.